Praise be Jesus and Mary. Now and forever. And today on this Eve of Divine Mercy Sunday, we see God's mercy in a curious way. And we can read about this in the first reading, the book of Acts, chapter 4, where Peter and John are before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, in order to answer for Peter's healing of a lame beggar. Acts 4, 13 is actually a very beautiful verse. It says this, it says, Observing the boldness of Peter and John and perceiving them to be uneducated, ordinary men, the leaders, elders, and scribes were amazed and they recognized them as companions of Jesus. So notice the adjectives that St. Luke uses to describe Peter and John. He calls them bold, uneducated, and ordinary. The Greek word that St. Luke uses for ordinary in Greek, it's idiotes. It means ordinary, it means common, it means ignorant. It might sound familiar. It's spelled I-D-I-O-T-E-S. It's actually where we get the English word idiot from. Uh, reading that reminded me of another, another passage from the Apostle St. Paul when he says in his letter to the Corinthians, he says this, quote, consider your call, brethren. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but rather God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly and the despised of the world, those who count for nothing, to reduce to nothing those who are something, so that no person might boast in the presence of God. Very beautiful, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 28. When the apostle says that God chose the foolish of this world to shame the wise, the word that he uses for foolish in Greek is moros. M-O-R-O-S, means foolish or stupid. It's where we get the word moron from, actually, in English, believe it or not. So from a biblical point of view, it's actually theologically correct to say God's favorite people are idiots and morons, believe it or not. <laughs> idiots meaning those who are common or ordinary people, morons, those who are foolish or stupid in the world's eyes. Putting that uh, does uh, put to light uh, everything that when I was told when I was younger, when I was called an idiot or a moron, it puts everything to a new light when I heard that. I said, okay, now I understand. I remember when I was in grade school, and we used to call it grammar school. I was in grade school at recess. We'd play touch football or something to the equivalent, and there would be the two captains, and the captains would choose who's on their team. Some of us have probably played that. And the worst thing, of course, is what? be picked last, right? To be last or next to last, that was always the worst. When you were a captain, what did you do? You picked the best kids first, right? I was always picked somewhere in the middle, so I was kind of ordinary. I was an idiot in that sense. I was just an ordinary player. Uh, when God chooses his team, he picks not only those who are ordinary, but he usually picks those who are picked last. He picks the foolish. He picks those who are considered stupid or without talent. God usually chooses talentless people for his team. Sometimes we don't think about that too much. In choosing someone to evangelize, we would choose someone who's, well, they have to be very educated, they have to be polished and refined and have good ways of speaking and interacting with others, maybe someone who's even young and attractive too, to attract attention, someone who's professional, essentially someone who you could easily be enamored with and impressed with. And sometimes even our critiques of others fall along those lines, don't they? We even critique others along that line. That, that person's a bit gauche, or they're a bit awkward, or they're crude, or not a very good speaker. We critique people superficially. Uh, even as priests and religious, sometimes we do this as well. We should know better than to do that. The apostle wrote to the people of Corinth. He said in 2 Corinthians 10, 10, for they say about me, St. Paul says, they say about me, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. I actually said that about the Apostle Paul. So even the great Saint Paul, considered by many to be one of, if not the greatest missionary who ever lived, even he was judged by some of the early Christians as a bit of a loser, right? Here comes Paul, well, he's a bit of a loser. Uh, we'll, we'll humor him and listen to him, but we don't want to really have anything to do with him. If you want to put it in modern lingo, can you imagine that, thinking that about St. Paul? 
They did, actually, the first Christians, some of them did. In choosing someone to evangelize and perform good works, God has different standards than we do. God chooses those whom you wouldn't choose, one, to humble you in your rash and superficial judgments, and sometimes even pharisaical judgments as well. I recently heard a very learned priest who was saying that 98% of all priests are stupid and lazy. He said, uh, and he said that, he said, I can say this because I'm a priest. 98% of priests are, are stupid and lazy. In all fairness, I think he was half joking when he said that, but unfortunately it is a bit of an elitist and pharisaical attitude. We have to be careful about that. Would Our Lady say that about her priests? I don't think so. Knowledge inflates with pride, but love builds up, says the Apostle, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. So we need to be careful about our judgments. God chooses those whom we wouldn't choose. One, first of all, to humble our pride. Secondly, God chooses those whom we wouldn't choose simply. Why? Because God shows no partiality. Those are St. Paul's words, Romans 2, verse 11. We all have equal dignity in God's eyes because he created us in his image and likeness. So there's an equal dignity in creation. And some of us, as we mentioned in the talk, you know, purely by God's grace, some of us have been adopted into his family through baptism. That being said, those who do evil in this life will be punished by God. Those who do good will be rewarded, says the apostle. Romans 2, verses 9 and 10. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, or what your last name is, or how successful or unsuccessful you are, God will judge all of us. Why? Because he shows no partiality. As we often mention, you look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, which of the two were successful in God's eyes? Which of the two were successful? Uh, well, was it the rich man? No, in the world's eyes, he was successful. In God's eyes, it was Lazarus. Lazarus, who died on the street, who died a beggar. He was a success in God's eyes. Why? Because God's standards are not the world's standards. God shows no partiality. Or rather, we can say that he's only partial to those who want to do what's right in his sight. Thirdly, God chooses those who we wouldn't choose as a sign that the good works that they do are from him and not merely from their own efforts or talents or abilities. Yes, we are called to use our gifts and talents, uh, the gifts that God has given us. We're called to use those for good, but God's grace is really what accomplishes anything that's good that we do, especially in terms of spiritual growth or spreading of the faith. It's God's grace, first and foremost. The apostle writes this. He says in Philippians 2, verse 12, he says, quote, Work with anxious concern to achieve your salvation. But then, very beautifully, he adds in verse 13, quote, It is God who, in his good will toward you, begets in you any measure of desire or achievement, says the apostle. So on the one hand, we are called to do good works to help achieve our salvation, but then the apostle says in reality, any desire or any good that we do is actually God's good. He's actually doing it through us. He's actually doing it in us. It is God who in his good will toward you begets in you any measure of desire or achievement. And that verse just builds upon what the apostle says elsewhere. Philippians 1, 6, he says, quote, I am sure that he who begun a good work in you, namely God, will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our growth in the faith, our growth in holiness, our successes and even sharing the faith, it's actually God's work from start to finish. We're just blessed to be able to participate in that. It's easy for some people, especially those who are very gifted or talented or who are very, shall we say, strong, it's easy for some people to fall into what's called a Pelagian mentality, meaning that they rely on their own efforts and strength more than they rely on God and on his grace. That's, what, that's why God chooses those who don't have much of anything to boast about. He chooses those who aren't really that, uh, really that high up in the world's eyes because they can't claim that the good that they do is because of what they have. Whatever good that they do comes from the Lord. 
if you want to put it in terms, I thought of it putting it in terms of our modern culture. I thought, well, maybe we can say that God prefers uh, like the Muppets and the Ewoks and the Hobbits uh, to the superheroes of Marvel, if you want to put it in those terms. I actually don't like the Muppets. I don't even know why I threw that in there. But God prefers those who are pretty despicable in the world's eyes to do his good works, not those who we think he should choose. Just to cement that point home, we'll again quote the apostle who says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it is not I, but the grace of God, which is with me. So he says, it's primarily God's work, not his, not ours. Can we give a couple of examples of our Lord choosing ordinary, unimpressive people to accomplish his works? Well, we can always think of Our Lady's apparitions, right? Uh, what type of people do our, does Our Lady usually choose to appear to? Usually it's the, the presidents of countries and heads of state and cardinals and great theologians, right? That's usually who Our Lady appears to. Well, actually, no. It's not who Our Lady usually appears to. She usually appears to simple, religious, or to people who are just unknown, insignificant, uneducated, little children, Fatima, for example, even St. Bernadette, uh, people who are unimportant and people who live in unimportant parts of the country, for that matter. Nathaniel asked, can anything good from Nazareth come, right? That was Nathaniel's question. Can anything good come from that little backward town of Nazareth, he asked in John 1, 46. Well, of course not, right? Nothing good can come from Nazareth except maybe uh, Jesus, the Son of God, and then maybe Mary, the Mother of God, and then maybe St. Joseph, patron of the Universal Church. So maybe some good things can come from some backward places. Or take, for example, St. Therese of Lisieux. After having died at the age of 24, the sisters in her convent said that there wasn't much to say about her because she didn't do anything extraordinary. There's not much we can say about her because she didn't do anything extraordinary in her life or as a sister, yet God's opinion of her was a little bit different, a little bit different. I like to think of always the example of St. Bernadette, right? St. Bernadette, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, I remember reading about how her mistress of novices and later her mother superior, I think it was Mother Marie Therese Bouzou, I'm not sure how to pronounce the, uh, the French there, she never believed uh, St. Bernadette's claims. Really, she never really fully believed St. Bernadette's claims about seeing Our Lady, and she treated St. Bernadette not too well in the convent. She described Bernadette as vain and simple. St. Bernadette, she's vain and simple. Uh, in Trochu's biography that he wrote, which is very good on St. Bernadette, uh, he has a chapter entitled in there, Martyrdom of Heart, talking about uh, St. Bernadette, and he writes how Mother Vuzu, uh, she admitted that every time she had something to say to Bernadette, she was prompted to say it bitterly. She just couldn't stand St. Bernadette. Uh, Bernadette was a burr in her saddle. Why? Well, I think part of it is because uh, she had trouble accepting and understanding this whole spiritual principle that God often chooses those who are simple and lowly to do great things. Uh, Mother Vuzu probably understands that now. Right after death, uh, we understand that she might be up there in heaven raking leaves and doing laundry in St. Bernadette's mansion. I think that might be one of, her, one of her penances. If it was, I can guarantee you she's loving doing it right now. She's absolutely loving doing that, uh, in truth. Her portrayal in that movie, The Song of Bernadette, it was a little harsh, but uh, there, are, there was some truth to that. I can think even of, uh, I don't want to mention anyone specifically because they're one of them's here, but I think we know Our Lady does wonderful things even with people who are around here, people who are simple and ordinary. Our Lady does extraordinary things through them as well. So if Jim wasn't here, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't mention what I wrote down. There are many other examples of this whole spiritual principle working itself out as well, but the prominent one that we have today in the readings is Saints Peter and John, bold, uneducated, ordinary people that Jesus chose as his apostles, men whom you and I would not choose. And Jesus continues to choose people whom the world says are unchoosable or even deplorable, right? Our God uh, does sometimes choose exceptionally gifted people. Sometimes he does, and thanks be to God for that. 
But my suspicion is more that that is the exception rather than the rule. So let's try to learn to see things more from God's point of view. Let's try to have an openness on how he does things. Let's also ask Our Lady on this Easter Saturday for the grace to become humble instruments of hers and, to, and of her son as well so that we can enjoy God's beautiful work of sanctification in our own souls and that so we too can share in his beautiful work of evangelization and conversion of minds and hearts. Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. Amen.